Okay, I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. Later in the pod, my interview with our friend Adi Barkin, who just launched a video series on health care featuring interviews with the Democratic presidential candidates, and whose new book, Eyes to the Wind, comes out Tuesday. Uh, but first, we got a lot of news to cover, from all of Trump's latest corruption to his canceled Taliban get-together, to new polling in 2020, <clears throat> sorry, to new 2020 polling that shows the top three Democratic candidates pulling away from the pack ahead of this week's debate. Uh, also, we have a new Crooked Minis for the month of September, and it's called State of Conspiracy. This month, we'll take a look at the rising popularity of political and anti-government conspiracy theories. Hosted by Professor Catherine Olmsted, an expert in conspiracy theories, this series will look at the rising popularity of political and anti-government conspiracies and how the Trump administration has contributed to their rise. Check it out. Finally, our schedule this week is a little different with the big debate on Thursday night, so our regular Thursday pod will move to Friday for a post-debate super pod with uh, me and Tommy and Dan. Uh, on Wednesday, we'll be doing a Q&A live stream on our YouTube channel. And on Thursday night, we'll be doing another live group thread, all of us, that you can catch on our YouTube channel. Uh, make sure you're subscribed there at youtube.com slash Cricket Media. You can get the live stream, you can get the group thread, all mm. kinds of good stuff there. I didn't agree to do any of this. Tommy did not agree to any of this. We're still in negotiations time. with Tommy. <laughs> Uh, and love it. Calling you're off the meeting. You can't do it. <laughs> and love it. You're joining us today from New York. You're not even here. No, I'm in. I'm in New York City. What's happening there? Why are you there? You have a show or something? Yeah, we have Radio City on Friday night. There are a precious few tickets left at this point. We got Stacey Abrams, Jesus and Miro, a bunch of really great guests. Wow. Alyssa Master Monaco, Wyatt Sinek, Dulce Sloan. Jam packed. Jam packed. Can't wait. Cool. Okay. So there's a lot of important news we're going to get to, but uh, before we do, we just we need to point out that the President of the United States has now spent more than a full week complaining that the media correctly reported that he spread false information when he said that the state of Alabama might be hit, quote, much harder than anticipated by Hurricane Dorian. In response, Trump attacked multiple media outlets and journalists by name, including a bizarre video he posted on Twitter just after midnight on Saturday that involved the weather map he doctored with a Sharpie, a cat, a laser pointer, and the CNN logo. Ugh. So Dan and I almost forgot to mention this stupid story on Thursday's pod, but when I saw the Washington Post story about how the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, uh, which is the parent agency of the National Weather Service, warned their staff, put out a public, put out a statement, warned their staff not to contradict the president's false information and publicly disavowed the completely accurate information released by their own Birmingham office. I started thinking that um, maybe this story does matter. Uh, what, what, <laughs> Tommy, what do you think? I think it matters uh, when a government agency is browbeaten by the president of the United States and his political hacks not to put out uh, information about a potential natural disaster that may or may not impact their life and safety and health. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of the nightmare scenario where George Orwell, 1984, we have a president of the United States whose ego is so fragile that he can't be corrected uh, when he tweets the wrong thing. It's insane. Yeah. It, and like, it's, it's kind of funny that this is all coming on the heels of his rage about the whole lost summer narrative. I mean, he just pissed away another week talking about whether or not a storm would hit Alabama. He just can't let it go. Yeah. Love it. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think with, with moments like this, you're reminded that with Trump, you're either honest or you're implicated. You know, when the president says something false, demonstrably, obviously false, and then you are asked, did the president say something false? Or if you're called by worried citizens in Alabama about whether the president said something false, you have to decide what's more important, telling the truth or staying out of the fray. There's no way to, to, to choose between the two. You're either complicit or you're honest. And, you know, we've seen countless politicians choose to not pick that fight because it's easier. And now we're seeing Noah do the same. And, you know, it's, it's this, this constant threat. It's, it, it's this constant reality with Trump that things are both silly and very dangerous, you know, and yeah. we, we, we struggle because both of those things can be true. It's, he, can, he can kind of, it's like author, authoritarian improv. You know, he kind of accidentally stirs up these incredibly dangerous uh, 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 forces, this idea of 
anything I say is true, and if you go against me, you're not telling the truth, you're part of the problem, you're the enemy, and the, the scariest thing we have learned over the last few years is how easy it was for someone who is disorganized and undisciplined and ultimately venal and craven and not out for any particular ideological purpose can cow so many people by sheer force of his personality, by sheer force of his willingness to pick every single fight, to not let any pitch go by. Yeah, I mean, people reported, well, the Washington Post reported that, uh, you know, Trump was the one who um, doctored the map himself. Big surprise. Uh, he, was the one, he, the, the, he was the one who held the Sharpie. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people have noted that that's illegal, that it's illegal to yeah. falsify a weather map. And the reason, the reason it's illegal, the reason there's that law in the first place is because it can put people's lives at risk, mm -hmm. right? Like, the, we, this actually matters to people. Like, we have to be able to trust th the information that our government pr provides, especially in times of crisis, especially in, uh, in the midst of a natural disaster. And now we can't trust that information mm -hmm. because we are at the whims of a narcissistic sociopath who not only lies to us himself, but now tries to pressure and force and bend the rest of the government to his will. I mean, like, these, the, the, the forecasters in the Birmingham office, they said, there's just a story out today, um, because the, the head of the National Weather Service said that the Birmingham forecasters who basically put out a tweet that said Trump is wrong were absolutely correct in doing so. And the reason that they put out a tweet, they actually didn't mention Trump in the tweet, they just said, oh, by the way, there's no forecast that's going to hit Alabama at all. Mm -hmm. Because all these worried people in Alabama are calling, are calling up the weather service there, and they're all worried. And Tommy, you and I were talking about this, but like, there's like local weather forecasters in Birmingham quoted as being like, I had to stand up here and say that this was wrong. I mean, this is to your point, love it. Like, you're making like local weathermen in Birmingham choose sides. <laughs> he, he's literally asking well, us to concede that the sky is not blue and that it is in fact filled with storm clouds and hurricane winds. Right, right, yeah, right, I mean, right. It, it is, it, it's insane. I mean, well, there's also the fact that he canceled his visit to Europe to commemorate World War II because he had to stay behind to monitor the storm, right? And what we know he did instead was play golf. So maybe he tweeted uh, factually inaccurate information or at least dated information that suggested Alabama might get hit with high winds because he just forgot the updated information he learned. Or maybe it was because he was dicking around on the golf course and he just tweets with reckless abandon and put out something that was wrong. Either way, like the fact that he is now engaged the media and Washington and the Weather Service in a six-day debate over this issue is infuriating. And there's, there's an element of this that is, it's so small and it's so petty that it's like you can't believe we're still talking about it. But there is a far more fundamental, fundamental principle at stake here, which is that we can't trust literally anything that comes right. out of his mouth. And God forbid there is a terrorist attack or something truly, truly awful that happens. No one will believe what he says. And meanwhile, he's utterly distracted from the actual effort to help people who were just hammered by this storm uh, in the Bahamas and, you know, the things coming up the, the eastern seaboard. So, like, it's, it's, it's just it's so frustrating. Yeah. I'm it's, uh, it's funny. To, you know, he was staying, he stayed home from Europe to work on the hurricane, which he didn't do because he has no work ethic, he has no discipline, no attention span. But if you introduce a personal grievance, like a little slight or an mm -hmm. insult, that gets him going. That gets him going. Passionate. <laughs> he it. is dedicated. He's like a dog. He, he, he is a dog who latches onto this. He runs this. I mean, he is, he is the, like, for a guy that cares about nothing, he is the Mother Teresa of nursing his ego. He is bedside 24 hours a day. He's got cold compresses. He's bringing soup. Like, he is. He is so attentive to his own psychological needs, but has no aptitude for anything else. And his team treats it all like a joke, right? They're now selling Sharpies yeah. from the campaign because they think it's funny that our president's a pathological liar. You know, this all flows from the people who were on the, the 2016 campaign, say the day of the Access Hollywood video was this big inflection point. You were either with Trump and the lies and all the awful things he did, or you weren't. And it's clear that, like, they just pledge absolute fealty to him and that's all that matters and and again the danger is here it's not just that like you know i saw tom perez 
over the weekend was telling, you know, DNC delegates and people like that, like they don't, we, they, the Democrats don't want to just focus on Trump's awfulness. They want to focus on how he's done a bad job and how his awfulness has actually affected people. And I think that's smart. And in this instance, we can all laugh about how it's fucking like day eight and we're still talking about Sharpie gate, but like the president's undiagnosed personality disorder here, like has a real impact. Like yeah. there was a story out this morning on CNN um, that the United States extracted one of its top spies from Russia in 2017 because they were worried that Trump would expose the identity to Putin, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like there is, he is putting all kinds of people in danger, in danger every time he pulls one of these, he has one of these episodes, he lies like this, he tries to cover up, he goes down the road of being a narcissistic sociopath. Like it is a danger to the country. It is not just him being a goofy asshole that we should all laugh at, you know? I think it's time for a conservative weather channel. I just think <laughs> I'm sick of the. That's where we're headed. I, I mean, it's not. That's not crazy to say. Weather. <laughs> he also uh. like just as I'm like working on this outline last night. We're all researching this for today. Like he goes on a tear late last night East Coast time because he watched MSNBC and saw like John Legend talking about criminal justice reform and John Legend didn't sufficiently praise Donald Trump. So not only did he attack John Legend, he attacked Chrissy Teigen calling her foul mouth. She didn't even have anything to do with the special. She wasn't involved. So. He just basically had a series of tweets where he was attacking black celebrities and journalists for not praising him enough for criminal justice reform. I, I mean, love it. You, you, <laughs> you joke about a conservative weather channel, but there was a clip going around the internet from OA CNN, which is the, the news organization that's to the right of Fox News that's even worse. Uh, and there was a clip where someone was referring to NOAA as a notoriously li liberal agency, I suppose, because they monitor the fact that the climate is changing. So, yeah, that's that's absolutely where we're going. That is terrifying. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's talk about a, a brand new scandal from the Trump administration oh, that offers yet another example of the president using his public office as a way to get richer. All at the expense of us, people mm -hmm. who pay taxes. Uh, on Friday, Politico broke the story that the House Government Oversight and Reform Committee has launched an investigation into whether the Department of Defense is helping Trump's struggling Scottish golf resort stay afloat by having crews stay there when Air Force planes refuel at a nearby airport, even though it's more expensive. Uh, on Sunday night, the Air Force announced it will be conducting an internal investigation into the matter after reporters uncovered additional instances of military personnel staying at Trump properties. Politico reporters, uh, sorry, Politico reports that at least one service member was frustrated that the food and drink at the Trump resort was over his government allowance. Uh, and this morning, of course, Trump tweeted that none of this has anything to do with him and that the Air Force merely has good taste. Um, <laughs> Tommy, how unusual <laughs> is what the Air Force did here, and how big of a deal should this be? I, I, it's it's so hard to tell. Like I, I will it's never early in the investigation. I, I'll <laughs> never pretend to understand things like uh, the way the military procures fuel or, or how they have people, you know, spend time different places. It does seem pretty weird that uh, they spent eleven million dollars the military at Prestwick Airport, which is the closest airport to Trump Turnberry. I would assume uh, that there are cheaper places to buy fuel for these planes based on our military's ability to procure like billions of dollars of it at a time. But who knows? There's also reports that the military uh, members are getting discounted rates and free golf at the club. So, you know, nice. I'm sure sweetener. they have plenty of time to do. But the club lost four and a half million in 2017, but revenue went up three million in 2018. So, you know, it seems like things are on the up and up. But like the key point, I think, is this is a great example of the fact that Trump is making millions of dollars every single week steering visitors to his D.C. hotel or to rent out spaces for events. I mean, Trump apparently, according to The New York Times, they track this. He's visited a Trump property on 293 days of his presidency. So basically a third of his presidency, he has spent time at one of his resorts. And when he goes and spends time in Mar-a-Lago or Bedford, that means the Secret Service is renting dozens of rooms and golf carts and just pouring money into his pocket. There's all kinds of reporting about the Saudis spending half a million dollars to rent out half of the hotel in D.C. or various grifters going in there. So it's a constant ongoing grift. Yeah. And there are members of Congress who had this little process called impeachment that they could use to really dig deep. And they'd just been sitting on their hands for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, you know, there was a great interview with uh, David Fahrenthold. He's a, a reporter at the Washington Post. He was on Fresh Air and it aired over the weekend. And he talked about, you know, all the things he's been doing to uncover uh, this grift. And it's just like, thank God for people like that, because Congress isn't doing shit to figure this out. Love it. What do you think of this story? Oh, I think it's really good. 
<laughs> great story for the administration. Put that one up on the refrigerator. I think it's great. I, uh, two, two thoughts. Two thoughts. <laughs> one, loves golfing, loves Scotland. This is a good one. I, I, one. Two thoughts. One, Trump has never behaved like he has cash. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Every, he is constantly behaving like he's about to run out of money. Uh, that was true when he was, like, even back in 2016 when he was debating whether to loan rather than give his campaign, I think it was $10 million at the time. Uh, you never get the sense that this is a man sitting on a lot of reserves. Uh, so uh, it seems as though every time he makes a decision to go golfing, it is because they are going to view, they, they view the presidency as a way to make money. And, and what I've said, you know, I've said this before, but I still think it's true. We will know that Donald Trump believes he is no longer going to be president soon when he starts admitting to the fact that he made money on the deal. That he will at some point start to say, what, I was president for four years? No, never supposed to happen. And I, look how much money I made on this. Yeah, uh, yeah. So <laughs> that is coming. That is coming. I mean, yeah, in what, in, I think a New York Times story about the Trump Hotel that ran over the weekend, um, they said that in private, Trump. Uh, pumps up his properties to people a lot more than he does in public. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. And, and raises it all the time and has concerns about it. Yeah, I mean, but like, okay, think about in 2016 what we were talking about both in the primary and the general election, Hillary Clinton, after she left public office, giving speeches and like not releasing the transcript of the speeches even though she was giving speeches on Wall Street and making money as a private citizen outside of politics. And we still all talked about the optics and there are legitimate concerns around that, right? But Donald Trump is in office, and the way he's making money while in office, while in public office, is not just a bunch of private citizens giving him money. It's the United States government. Mm -hmm. It's our tax dollars are making him richer. Like, if Democrats can't make a fucking issue out of this, I, like, it, let's go home. And here's, here's an avenue, John. Uh, the, uh, the Trump International Hotel, they lease the old po post office building in Washington, and that's, that's the Trump Hotel. The House Transportation Infrastructure Committee has oversight over that property. So Peter DeFazio, a congressman out of Oregon, could request a whole bunch of documents. For some reason, he has not. Seem, people seem to think it's because he thinks there might be some big infrastructure deal that gets cut with Trump down the road. <laughs> what are we doing? Yeah, <laughs> no, in, in, infrastructure week's right around the corner yeah. as soon as he uh, starts talking about the fucking weather. Infrastructure map. week's yeah, a national we're, joke. We're Get the, the documents, DeFazio. Um, well, so the, the good news. <laughs> Get the, <laughs> Get the, the documents, documents DeFazio. You son of a bitch. You get those fucking documents. Well, I'm, so I'm sure he's a great congressman. What are we doing? I mean, the, the good news on the House Democratic front is uh, the New York Times reported over the weekend that the House Democrats are widening their impeachment inquiry to include accusations of corruption against Trump. Just in the uh, nick of time. And they'll be voting on formalized procedures to guide the impeachment impeachment inquiry this week, which is good. Um, you know, Congressman James, uh, Jamie Raskin, sorry, let me say it again. Congressman Jamie Raskin uh, said the focus needs to be on corruption, quote, the central sin, the original sin of the Trump administration is the decision to convert the presidency into a money-making operation for the president and his business and his family. Yes, correct. that is the message. Correct. Listen to Jamie Raskin. That's great. Lean into that. Yeah, I mean, I think, we, but although, so I'm reading this story, <laughs> as I'm sure you guys did, about how, like, House Democrats are widening the inquiry to include corruption. And I was like, yes, this is what we've been talking about. Great, wonderful. And then the last paragraph of the story <laughs> says this. With the Republican-controlled Senate highly likely to acquit Mr. Trump, even if the House's case were put to trial, some Democrats have begun raising another possibility, that the Judiciary Committee could draft articles of impeachment, vote them out of the panel, but never bring them to the floor of the House, offering the public an election year indictment of sorts without ever bringing the president to trial. <laughs> I think it's great. Yeah, I think it's sorts. a really cool strategy. I would say one other thing that I would suggest is actually like print it really, really small. So that, um, like, you need, like, a magnifying glass to see it. Or maybe you could, like, release it as an audiobook, but only at a whisper. Just at a whisper. Like, do not bother. Please do not bother if that's the path you're going to go down. Like, way to, way to get all of the political risk for impeachment because everyone will say the Democrats impeached Donald Trump. But none of the upside, which is months of hearings where you tell the American public why he's a fucking criminal. Yeah, you know, it's funny. We, people say this all the time. People say this all the time, right? They say, imagine what Republicans would do if Obama did something like this. Mm -hmm. Imagine, ima we're going to talk about it when we talk about uh, Trump inviting the Taliban for a right. jamboree at Camp David. <laughs> but but I, 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 I think it's worth like stopping for a second and thinking, like, what does it mean when people say that? Imagine what, imagine what Republicans can do. And sometimes it means 
Uh, imagine if Democrats used the same kind of reckless, intellectually dishonest, scorched earth, or scorched earth, scorched earth politics of Republicans. And I don't think that's a good idea. But sometimes it just means imagine if Democrats fought as hard for what they believe in as we often see Republicans fighting. Uh, as we often see how hard Republicans fight for what they believe in. And to me, like, this is an example of that. There's just this, you just feel this lack of fire in the belly, which is what I think so many Democrats have been, have been sort of hungering for, and that's why they knocked on doors in 2018. And then you, you see an argument like that, and it's like it's really dispiriting. Yeah. yeah. And, this, and look, this is the, the corruption part of this, right? Like, I get how tough it is to like you know walk people through the whole Mueller report and why Trump is a criminal, what obstruction of justice means, why it matters to your life, all this kind of stuff. I get all that. This corruption angle, like it's put ongoing. Up, put up a big fucking calculator on a website and say like how much is Donald Trump costing you? How many of your tax dollars did he spend on this? Add up all the money he's made in the Trump organizations. Like this is not a hard thing to do, exactly. right? Like journalists, good media outlets are doing this all over the place. They have all kinds of charts about this. They're adding this up like fucking, you know, House Democrats do something. Be creative about this. We've learned so much about Donald Trump and his finances despite all efforts he's made to, to prevent that kind of disclosure over the last couple of years. And if you think back to, say, the Benghazi hearings, because the Republicans were relentlessly focused on a non-scandal and doing everything they can to get documents and subpoena witnesses, they figured out that Hillary had this private email address. Yeah. And if not for that dogged, unfair, unethical at times effort, they never would have had their number one campaign issue. So why don't we get caught trying? I don't, I, maybe I'm back to being opposed to impeachment. <laughs> we obviously don't have our shit together to do literally anything. Anything. <laughs> this was always my my like the, my opposition to impeachment, which was at like five percent, was always rooted in that. Like, yeah. Well, but like, I, I do want it, and I want to see it happen. But you can't fuck it up because if you fuck it up, it's going to be worse than <laughs> worse than if you never yeah, did I mean, it in the first you, place. Yeah. But the other thing I would just add too is just to add to the the kind of corruption angle too is we've one of the things that's broken through over the last two years uh, was when Trump you know when Trump got so. Uh, 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 buddy-buddy uh, buddy with Putin in, in, in Helsinki and sort of apologized to the United States. The other piece of this corruption is how it's influencing our policies every single day and how he has sidled up to dictators and, and, and coddled dictators in part because he views them as a place where he has a financial interest, where he was trying to build hotels before he became, or where he was trying to build properties before he became president, where it seems as though he's imagining his empire growing after he's president. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about... Uh the uh, the biggest news of the weekend, which was the canceled Taliban slumber party at Camp David. Mm -hmm. um, the president announced via Twitter in between cat videos that he was calling off peace negotiations with the Taliban, whose leaders he had secretly invited to Camp David, along with the president of Afghanistan, the same week as 9-11. The New York Times reported that the cancellation came after a long-running dispute within the administration about negotiating with the Taliban to end the two-decade war in Afghanistan and disagreement over the deal that was emerging from those negotiations. Tommy, I want to get your reaction to this story, but first, can you give us a primer on uh, what we know about these negotiations, what the goals have been, and what kind of issues need to be resolved? Sure. So we currently have about 14,000 uh, troops in Afghanistan. Uh, remember that Trump actually had promised in the campaign to end the war in Afghanistan, but actually sent more guys there. So that's important context, yep. I think. Um, it sounds like there was an, a deal in principle that had been made between uh, Zalmay Khalilzad and the Taliban, they negotiated over the course of maybe 10 months or longer, that agreed to pull out 5,400 U.S. troops and close five bases over the course of, say, five months after the deal was agreed to. The goal then was to get the rest of our guys out uh, over the course of a year, maybe a year and a half. But, you know, it's notable that this whole timeline is built around Trump's reelect. The deal was basically we pull out troops, uh, the Taliban cuts ties with al-Qaeda, you help us deal with ISIS, uh, and maybe long, long, long term, it leads to some power sharing agreement with the Taliban over the future of Afghanistan. It's important to note that there was no requirement for the Taliban to stop attacking Afghan civilians or the government or their troops during that period. In none. the deal, in, in any the deal. of the deals that were no, no, none of this. So it's weird for the Trump to act like that's what blew up the talks. Um, because that latter question, that latter issue of negotiating with the Afghans themselves is the hard part. It's, it's very easy for the U.S. to make a deal with the Taliban. It's hard for the Afghan government because the Taliban, they don't recognize that they exist. They won't engage them. So 
that's part of why this Camp David business is so screwed up. Trump is essentially forcing Ashraf Ghani, the president of Afghanistan, to show up at this made-for-TV spectacle at Camp David so that Trump can triumphantly pretend that he just glued this peace deal together. Meanwhile, Ghani has an election coming up on, uh, on the 28th of this month, and the Taliban is, like, blowing up the capital, killing civilians, and Ghani's getting briefed on this deal. He's not at all happy with it, but his choice is skip this event and be called anti-peace and risk 400 Trump tweets at you or, or don't go. So, you know, here we are. Like, it, it doesn't make any sense to me that Trump uh, actually believes that this suicide attack is what led him to call off negotiations. Everyone knows that the Taliban, they increase their level of attacks while they're negotiating to create leverage. By the way, so do we. Pompeo was on the Sunday shows bragging that we'd killed a thousand Taliban in 10 days. So like, unfortunately, that's the way the war is. But so I'll pause there. But like, it, none of this speaks to the need to have a conversation at Camp David. Well, so yeah, I was going to say like, it, it, I, I, I can only imagine how difficult these issues are to negotiate with the Taliban, the Afghan government, the US government. We've been probably doing it, trying to do it for years now, yep. right? But it does seem like the deal emerging, which was we pull all of our troops out and we get a sort of vague promise from the Taliban not to, you know, um, allow Al Qaeda to uh, attack us. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't seem like the bet. Like I don't know, does, does that a, was that an okay deal if they were able to strike that deal? Because it seems like the killing in Afghanistan continues. I mean, it depends on who you are, right? right? If you're the U.S. government and your concern is an ISIS or Al Qaeda safe haven in Afghanistan, maybe that's the best you're going to get. If you're an Afghan citizen who doesn't want to live under Afghan rule, I'm sorry, under Taliban rule in some parts of the country, it's a horrible deal. But for Trump, he wants the press he got from the Singapore summit. And uh, that diplomacy is a total disaster, by the way, with North Korea. We should talk about it some other time. But like, I think we all should be happy that he likes the press he got out of uh, diplomatic you know, events more than, like, say, blowing up uh, Syria. But, uh, you know, like... This was this made no sense. I mean, the the Taliban, as of I think a couple of weeks ago, put out a video saying they still supported the 9/11 attacks. Yeah. Um, you know, like there's no need for them to come and like be at this amazing you know piece of the crown jewel of like where the president actually ends up living. And by the way, like th we can negotiate with the Taliban in a million places. We've been negotiating with them in Qatar with some of the individuals who were swapped as part of the Bo Bergdahl prisoner swap. Remember when McCain and Graham told us that was the worst thing that's going to ever happen. So, like, I support peace talks. The, the Afghanistan war has gone on longer than World War I, World War II, and the Korean War combined. But having these guys come to Camp David for a made-for-TV event for Trump, for his re-elect, is craven bullshit. Love it. What did you think of the... Uh the wisdom of the stagecraft of having a Camp David meeting with the Taliban the week of 9-11. I thought it was uh, politically risky at best, John. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so two, two quick points about this, because, you know, uh, Tommy, he's got it covered. Is, uh, one, it's a reminder of how often Trump just says something. This was a case where we learned something via Trump tweet yeah. that was, fascinating and important and new and concerning and, and didn't make sense. And then you have to spend the next week trying to figure out what the actual truth is, because mm -hmm. everything he says is fabricated in some way or, or uh, uh, self-aggrandizing in some way or just flat out wrong. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, this is what's happened with North Korea. This was what, what he's seeking to do with the Taliban. He, he doesn't care about exposing the presidency or lowering the presidency uh, to meet with someone like uh, 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 the North uh, to meeting with someone like Kim Jong Un uh, without having done the kind of preliminary work, or by inviting the Taliban to Camp David, because he doesn't value these institutions. He has no respect for them. He doesn't care about them. He doesn't view the presidency as anything other than a kind of toy for him to play with. So of course he's going to just want to grab onto something and bring bring people uh, uh, to the United States, even though that that sends a terrible message, even though that elevates people, even though that. It, it, it's something you have to, uh, that, that there should be, you know, diplomatic work and other work that happens long before anything like that takes place because he just doesn't care about these institutions. It doesn't occur to him to value or protect him. It doesn't occur to him to value or protect anything other than his own personal stake. Yeah, I mean, like, 
we hosted the G7 at Camp David. Yeah. This is these are a bunch of fucking Taliban goons. Like they're not foreign heads of state. They're a terrorist group. They were killing U.S. service members this week, and now Trump has blown up this process. Who knows when we'll get back into it? And the Afghans are scared shitless that this is going to lead to a huge surge in violence, uh, especially with the election coming up on the 28th. So, uh, this is it, like. I, I, you can say what if this was Obama to so many different things. This is like one of the ultimate what if this was Obama. Well, like, <laughs> of course, Trump attacked Obama in 2012 for having talks with the Taliban. So there's always a tweet. But met, like, <laughs> Pfeiffer was texting us this over the weekend. He was like, if Barack Obama brought the Taliban to Camp David, Fox would need to start immediately another Fox news station just to contain all of the attacks on Barack Obama. Why not the Lincoln bedroom? Why not have him at the fucking White House? Like it was, uh, Why go halfway? But like, so the New York Times did a really great TikTok on what you were saying, Love It, trying to like backtrack from his tweet on everything that actually happened. And they updated it, you pointed out, Tommy, late last night with the paragraph that really says it all because they were saying, a fundamental dividing point that was contributing to the collapse of the talks was this. Mr. Trump did not want the Camp David meeting to be a celebration of the deal. After staying out of the details of what has been a delicate effort in a complicated region, Trump wanted to be the deal maker who would put the final parts together himself, or at least perceived to be. So, one of the things that collapsed this whole fucking deal was the fact that Trump wasn't gonna, didn't think he was going to get enough credit for it, even though he didn't deserve the credit for it. <laughs> he, uh, he doesn't... He, it's, he wants to lick the spoon with the batter on it, and then say he made a cake. I mean, he he wanted to be Jimmy Carter, like sitting between Sadat and and, and Began and like bringing these you know the sides together. It's just I, I'm I'm blown away by how crazy this is. Never in a million years did I think Donald Trump would want to bring the Taliban to Camp David. But he is a you know he is a uh, reality fucking TV star, and the whole thing is just the whole thing is a show. The whole thing now is the, a show. Uh, the next person uh, who hates him, he's trying to get to Camp David, is Melania Trump, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, but seriously, he's terrible. <laughs> there you go. That's, uh, that's the kind of analysis we crave. <laughs> um, all right. Tip your servers. <laughs> Let's, uh, you can see more of this at Radio City on Friday Radio evening. Radio City Music Hall. Can you believe it? <laughs> All right, let's talk about uh, let's talk about 2020. Okay. Um, as 10 candidates get ready to meet in Houston for a third round of debates on Thursday evening, CBS released a set of early state polls, which we cannot say enough are a lot more useful than national polls, um, that show three front runners and everyone else, you know, a little far behind. Uh, in Iowa, it's Joe Biden at 29 percent, Bernie Sanders at 26 percent, and Elizabeth Warren at 17 percent. New Hampshire is Warren 27, Biden 26, Sanders 25. South Carolina is Biden 43, Sanders 18, Warren 14. Mm -hmm. And in Nevada, it's Sanders 29, Biden 27, Warren 18. No one else polled in double digits in any of the four states. So, guys, the lead of the CBS story about these numbers is, quote, this poll tells a story about Elizabeth Warren rising, but not Joe Biden falling. Um, Tommy, do you agree with that? And what, is, what does a race look like where those two things are happening? It's a good question. I mean, I, I do think it speaks to something I heard over and over again in Iowa when I was there for a few days was just how hard it is to break through if you're not a top tier candidate, yeah. if you're not seen as part of the national conversation about electability and beating Trump and, and everything else. And I think it also speaks to the fact that Elizabeth Warren is running a good campaign. The conversation about Elizabeth Warren is how she has plans and she's running a good campaign. And that's that's helping her over time. Other people are just not getting a look. I mean, these debates might be, you know, their last chances, <clears throat> potentially, yep. to really do something exciting and, and break through. Ultimately, I do think the results in Iowa will be the biggest springboard for whomever does the best to get that last media bounce and do well in New Hampshire and start racking up delegates. But I think it ultimately speaks to a relatively stable race, except for this rise of Warren. Yeah, love it. What did you, what did you take from it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I, I, I think it's worth remembering, too, that we've, we've have seen candidates uh, break this kind of hold that Biden, Warren, Sanders have in the field. Kamala Harris did it at the last debate. There are still opportunities for candidates to do that. To me, I mean, I think the, one of the stories of what's happened is 
Kamala surged and then wasn't able to maintain that lead, and I think it's worth asking why, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that many stories about Kamala Harris's campaign tend to be about what Kamala Harris's campaign is doing to, to fix Kamala Harris's campaign. Yeah. And that's been sort of a trap that her campaign has been in for a long time, in part because I think she struggled to find an argument a message that stands out from the three being offered, which are pretty cogent at this point, from Biden, Warren, and Sanders. I also think it says something about Elizabeth Warren's challenge going forward. So there's been a lot of there's a lot of talk about lanes in the primary, and a lot of people when they talk about lanes, they think of ideological lanes, and so they think there's a progressive lane and a moderate lane. But the truth is, Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders um, draw their support disproportionately from non-college educated white voters, um, younger uh, non-college educated white voters, and also um, non-college educated uh, black voters and Latino voters, and, and in Joe Biden's case, black voters in total. And it does seem at times like when you look into digging into some of these numbers, Elizabeth Warren and Kamala Harris and Pete Buttigieg and even Cory Booker and Beto O'Rourke and some of the other candidates are all fighting over a lot of college-educated white progressives. And these polls sort of show that Elizabeth Warren is winning that fight. She sort of, consult a lot of these people, you know, it shows that these polls show that people who were supporting Harris before have moved to Warren. She's getting support from some of the other lower-tier candidates who are losing support. They're all going to Warren now. So she's consolidating a lot of the college-educated um, white liberals uh, vote. But the question is, if she wants to beat Biden, beat Sanders... She's got to break into, she's got to start doing better with non-college educated white voters and black voters and Latino voters better than she's doing. And the question there is, are these voters just not into her yet or are they not closely engaged in the race yet? Because we know that the most engaged voters right now are these college educated white liberals. Mm -hmm. And so that's the question that we can't answer yet. Yeah. Um, I also thought like, do you, would you guys look at these polls and think that maybe people have been underestimating Bernie Sanders' strength as he's hanging in there and all these polls first or second in most of these states? That's a good question. I mean, to me, Bernie's sort of ability to stick it out probably speaks a lot to name identification and comfort level with him. I mean, Biden, for all the, the criticisms you see of him and policies and previously held positions and gaffes and all this crap that sort of swirls on Twitter every day. Most people just know that he's a, a popular vice president for a popular two-term president yeah. who they've seen on the national stage for eight years and think like, oh, that guy looks like a president because they saw him in the White House for eight years. Bernie Sanders is someone that was pretty well introduced to the country in 2016. I think unless you are a, a hardcore Hillary Clinton supporter, you probably have a relatively favorable impression of Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Um, I think that he needs to do more to make inroads with the folks who were ride or die for Hillary. And I'm not sure that they have achieved that quite yet. Uh, but, you know, B Bernie comes off as likable and charming and consistent. So, you know, I think that's probably what people know of him. Yeah. And there also there is a progressive. I mean, I, I just said that there was a sort of a lane of college educated versus non-college educated voters. There's also a, he's fighting Elizabeth Warren for progressive voters. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they both are fighting each other for that, for the, the most progressive voters. Love it. What did you think? Yeah, I mean, the thing I would add is, you know, Bernie, in part, you know, Bernie was uh, captured a larger share of the electorate when he was facing just Hillary Clinton. So one question I'd have is, where are the people who supported Bernie before? Uh, where did they go? And I would imagine many of them went to Elizabeth Warren and some to other candidates. But there's a kind of, yeah, a, an ideological alignment between Warren and uh, uh, Bernie that I think is a challenge for both of those campaigns. Yeah. I also think it shows that, like, none of the candidates have really figured out how to peel away some of Joe Biden's support. No. That the that the focus on and it's not it's not really just a, a candidate focus because it's really sort of a media focus and sort of some of the surrogates and the campaign staff and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of focus on his gaffes, a lot of focus on is he losing a step, a lot of focus on you know is he sufficiently progressive enough, and. I think at some point it's time for some of these candidates to realize that those lines of attack on Biden are not really having an effect and that if you want to start peeling away Biden's support, you're going to have to find another argument.
Yeah, I mean, certainly it was true that Kamala Harris was able to, I think, do a number on Biden at that first debate. I think that some of the attacks on Biden at the second debate backfired. Yeah. And that it might have, I mean, I heard this anecdotally, but that a lot of the criticisms people heard came off as nitpicking or too negative or unfair in some way. I'm not saying I agree with those descriptions, but those are just some of the things I heard from various people. So, yeah, I mean, I do think they're going to need a more effective way to go after him. Maybe as folks pay attention uh, more closely in the fall, like, People will just think harder about what they want of the next president who they think can win. I still think this electability question is is all consuming for most voters in early states. Yeah. And I think that the other candidates have to make a case for their own electability. And I think that they can. I think each one of them has a good argument about yep. why they're the most electable candidate. And some of them are different. Um, I also think like, you know, this debate that's coming up this week, like Kamala Harris and Pete Buttigieg and some of the others do sort of have to figure out a way to differentiate themselves from these three front runners. Mm -hmm. um, Buttigieg sort of gave a hint of that over the weekend uh, in New Hampshire. He said, we need ideas big enough to meet this moment, but it's not enough to think up good policy. We've got to unify Americans around these solutions or nothing will actually get done. It's why I'm not making uh, some of the promises that some of the candidates to my left are. I share the goals and believe that we can do it in a way that will bring Americans together. What do you guys think of that? That's interesting because that's not... Pete Buttigieg thinking, I need to take down Biden. That's him thinking, I need to differentiate myself from Sanders and Warren. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's saying we need an alternative to Biden, mm. right? Which I think has actually right. been motivating a number of candidates. I think it's actually why a number of candidates have been staying in the race, um, from Michael Bennett to Buttigieg and others. There's a, there's a kind of, you know, under <laughs> an unspoken aspect to all of this, which is we don't really know if Biden is the Trump of this race, the person who may not have a majority, but will have a strong plurality that carries them to the nomination, and because everyone else is kind of divided, no one becomes an alternative and Biden gets the nomination, or is he more like a Jeb, who is someone who has garnered a lot of establishment support and uh, 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 some money and some, some talent, but ultimately doesn't have what it takes to win the nomination. And I think there are a bunch of candidates who are looking at Joe Biden and saying, I'm going to bet on this candidacy being softer than it looks, and that that 30% at some point becomes 25, becomes 20, becomes 15, and all of a sudden people are deciding between Warren and an alternative, whoever that may be. Yeah, it was a, it was a subtle contrast, and it was interesting departure from a purely generational contrast, although yeah. that was probably infused in the speech, and frankly, just seeing Pete on stage with some of these candidates makes the generational contrast more than anything he could actually say. The thing to watch with Pete is um, he's got money. Yeah. And he's investing it in early states. And when I saw him at the state fair, he had a big ass crowd on a Tuesday and how he's opened like a dozen more offices and he's up on TV early. And so, look, anything can happen in these races. I mean, we all remember 2004 when Howard Dean was going to be the nominee and it was a runaway effort. And then there was essentially this just negative, you know, murder suicide between him and Dick Gephardt in the closing days for Iowa. And then John Kerry and John Edwards emerged. So like there's a million different ways it could play out, but I would feel pretty good if I were Pete and I had resources. I wouldn't feel great about the fact that my, the, the surge I'd seen in the polls, relative surge uh, has dipped a little bit. Yeah. And I think for him, if you're going to make this case, that it's it's fair to make it, but you got to go all the way. You don't have to like whack everyone else on stage, yeah. but you got to get into the details. You cause, because spell it out. Really, what he's talking about is you know he's for Medicare for all who want it, as opposed to Medicare for all. So that is a real difference that he has with Warren and Sanders that he could talk about a lot at this debate. Um, on some of the other issues, it's not as clear. You know, he's he's pretty much taken a lot of the progressive positions. He has sort of talked about how he cares more about the deficit than some other Democrats, too. So maybe he makes that case. Um, but I think the last two debates he had, he's had some pretty good debates and he's been pretty solid. But he has been reluctant to draw differences between him and the other candidates on stage. And he probably has to do that on Thursday uh, and still do it in a way that is respectful and true to himself. Right. Because that's the kind of campaign he's running. So that should be interesting to watch. And it should be interesting to watch what Kamala Harris does, too, because, you know, her she said her message over the weekend was, you know, there's so much more that unites us than divides us, which is not really 
a message about differentiating yourself too much from everyone else, but is trying to be the person who says, okay, enough of all this like infighting, we should all sort of take on Donald Trump together because more unifies us, which is an interesting message, but also different from how she was with Biden in previous debates. So mm-hmm. that's sort of interesting to watch mm-hmm. too. Yeah, it's also like that, that it's, um, it's like partially rhetorical. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a rhetorical argument, which I don't think actually has much value. And I don't, you know, in, in Pete's ad, he talks about how we need solutions. And again, it's like, I don't know, I, whenever now, I, maybe it's because I still carry some uh, emotional baggage <laughs> from 2008, but whenever someone says, like, we need solutions, I, I just know, see I know, I know. a poll document that makes me think somebody, they want solutions, they don't want partisanship, and so I'm going to start saying that. Yep. But with, with Kamala, you know, I think that there's this, there is this opening, right, which, I, which she seems sort of like half willing to take, which is, all right, so you like Warren and you like Bernie because they're further to the left and they're, they have a big argument for, system, uh, for, for structural change that we need in this country, and you agree with that, but then you look at someone like Joe Biden and you see polls that show that he, he is doing better against Trump in some key swing states and you're terrified of losing, you're terrified of what's going to happen to the country if we don't put up the right candidate, and so, so you're torn because you want big liberal ideas, but you want to win more than anything and you don't know how to sort through this. Well, here I am, someone who's going to kind of split the difference. <laughs> and maybe there's a maybe there's a compelling way to make that argument. I don't know, but I'm still it all it just so it just feels like we're still, you know, I don't know, dancing around that specific case. I just think that the the, the message that's gonna resonate in Iowa especially is gonna be about how you're the person who can beat Donald Trump. And I think And why to the extent that folks are, are are making cases where they're sort of obliquely criticizing policy ideas as too big or too small or too destructive, I just kind of think you're missing the boat. Like of course people care about policy, like the healthcare debate is, is fundamental and existential for a lot of people. But all of them are resigned to the fact that it is irrelevant what your plan says if you don't win. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, when we come back, um, my interview with Adi Barkin. 